Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Big box retailers, led by Walmart and Target, are pushing for a bill in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. Senate Bill 1838 would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, visit handsoffmyrewards.com and tell them to oppose credit card routing legislation paid for by the Electronic Payments Coalition. Okay, everybody, it's Michael E. Cullen II. And I'm Sesame Encarta from the All Too Real 2 podcast. We're passionate about movies, TV, and pretty much all things pop culture. Dive into the chaos of failed sitcoms, direct-to-video sequels, and the quirky realms of cinema and TV. Join us every Thursday for your dose of All Too Real 2 entertainment. We'll guide you through debates like whether Howard the Duck qualifies as a superhero. Ponder if Larry the Cable Guy could be the new rock or Schwarzenegger. Discover if some shows and movies should have stayed in the cutting room. Ever heard of a sitcom featuring that dictator with the funny mustache? Well, we watched it. We're dedicated to unraveling the peculiarities of pop culture, sometimes with awesome guests. So, if you're into the eccentric world of pop culture, listen and subscribe to All Too Real 2. Available wherever you find podcasts and on Age of Radio. Cleo holds in her hand a half-opened scroll, and we shall never read its unopened part. I came across those words while spending quite a bit of time with my father in the last few months of his life. Whenever he took a nap or dozed off, I'd wait for him to wake back up by reading and writing much of what has become a few of the last several episodes and some of the ones that have yet to be recorded and released. And that phrase, as simple as it is, it hit me because I wasn't quite sure how to understand it, what to make of it. I think I understand it, though. For you, it might seem much clearer, but was it about the future? How the unopened part was about the future which with each passing day becomes history, and we will never know what a lot of that's going to be. Or was it, and I think this might be what the author intended, about all that we have yet to learn about the past, but never will. I mean, we hope that we someday might learn more, but I'm still not quite sure. Is it about... There will be some that's going to be rewritten as we learn more about the past and we'll get greater understanding. But with the passage of time and we don't know what will be uncovered in the future. Or perhaps it's just as simple as it sounds. There are just some things we'll never know. I'm not sure. I'm still not quite sure. And maybe it'll come to me before I get done with this recording. So if you have an idea, then let me know what you think. Now, Cleo, as many of you already know, was the muse of history in Greek mythology. And the muses in Greek and Roman mythology were nine goddesses who presided over the arts and sciences. And Cleo was the daughter of Zeus and Menosomy, which makes sense that her daughter, her being the... Goddess of history should be the daughter of memory. They're tied together, memory and history, which is an interesting balance because we've talked a lot about the difference between collective memory and history. So you'll often hear the word muse used when somebody's talking about a person or a personified force who is the source of inspiration for a creative artist. And this sentence, Cleo holds in her hand a half-open scroll, and we shall never read its unopened part. That sentence was written by a very extremely brilliant person that I learned about named Lucy Maynard Salmon. I'll share more about her in a bit. But first, let's return, as promised, 
to Frederick Jackson Turner. Now, in the closing part of the last episode, I commented on how serious people take the stories that we tell ourselves about our history, especially the Texas story, the Texas history. And I commented in the last episode about how there are many uses for the study of history. And at times, no matter how good intentions we might be, we do disagree. And also, as I've mentioned before, I've often heard, and you probably have too, read statements along the lines that this person or that person, they're fine with what somebody is doing related to Texas history, as long as it's the real history of Texas. Now, this is a troubling statement. It's troubling to me because the statement carries the assumption that there is an already determined, authoritative account that is the history of Texas that must not be tampered with. Much like fundamentalist Christians assert that the Bible is an inerrant and infallible text that is the sole repository of truth. Yet, if you are, like me, familiar with Christianity, and especially like me, fundamentalist and evangelical Christianity, then you know that even regarding the teachings of the scriptures, there are often severe differences regarding interpretation and application of this inerrant and infallible source. There is no inerrant, infallible Texas history. T.R. Fahrenbach's Lone Star might be the best-selling book on Texas history, but it is not complete. It's not perfect. It doesn't contain everything. Several authors from Yoakum, who I've mentioned before in previous episodes, who wrote in the 1800s, to the great Randolph B. Campbell, who wrote in the 2000s, have created extremely valuable histories of Texas. Not one is complete, and I doubt one will ever be. I was listening to a good podcast the other day that's put out by two academic historians and they were talking about how they were hinting at that they might write a history of Texas and one of the things they stressed in that episode was the fact that they could write one because there was no the history of Texas Texas history is a part of the bigger exploration of our past and the attempt to tell stories of the past that have meaning to those living in the present and for those that will live in the future. It isn't that the works that have been written in the past are bad or should be relegated to the history trash dump. No, they are still quite valuable. But they do not contain everything that could be shared, and I doubt any one historical work can contain everything that can be learned, which is a reason that it is great that there are so many people exploring the past from different directions as their point of entry, different perspectives, different interests. It's all valuable in the way it contributes to our understanding of the past. Now, here is a lengthy but important quote that I want to add before I move on by historian Felipe Fernandez Ernesto in his book, Our History, concerning what I'm trying to explain. And it begins with, Citizens of the United States have always learned the history of their country as if it unfolded exclusively from east to west. In consequence, most of them think their past has created a community, essentially, even necessarily, Anglophone, with a culture heavily indebted to the heritage of radical Protestantism and English laws and values. Immigrants with other identities have had to compromise and conform sacrificing their languages and retaining only vestigially distinctive senses of their peculiarities as hyphenated Americans. The heirs of slaves have had to subscribe to the same process. Natives who preceded the colonists have had to surrender and adapt. Of course, the Andy Griffith version of U.S. history is not wrong. The country, like the stripes in the flag, is woven in part of a horizontal weft 
stretching across the continent. But no fabric exists without a strong warp crisscrossing at right angles from bottom to top. The Hispanic story of the United States constitutes the warp, a north-south axis along which the United States was made, intersecting with the east-west axis highlighted in conventional perspective, making the Hispanic contribution conspicuous. Is like tilting the map sideways and seeing the United States from an unusual approach. History is a muse. I'll interject, there's that word again. He continues, history is a muse you glimpse bathing between leaves. The more you shift your point of view, the more is revealed. I do not say this for some postmodern reason, in order to imply that historical reality is non-existent or inaccessible. On the contrary, I think the truth is out there, but truth cannot be grasped easily or all at once. We build up a picture bit by bit, rather as circling a sculpture or a building. We compose an overall impression by contemplating each fragment, each aspect at a time. The advantage of a shift of perspective is that it adds to our stock of perceptions and gets us near to the truth. The objectivity that lies at the sum total of all possible subjectivities. Fresh perspectives always enhance our vision by challenging our assumptions. Think of the Argentine or Australian maps of the world that put South at the top, or a still life by Paul Cezanne, who, resuming work every morning, would set up his easel in a different spot in order to place each object he painted in a peculiar perspective of its own. Now, in the book that he was writing, he goes on to say that he was deliberately taking a perspective from a certain point of view and that it was not in any way supposed to be considered a complete perspective, but that it should add to the whole. I know what some of you are thinking and grumbling Here you go with this new age leftist revisionist history spiel. But really, I'm not doing any of that. I'm basing my statements on good old fashioned history. Let me explain. As I promised quite a while back, I'm now returning to the work and thoughts of Frederick Jackson Turner. And then I want to introduce you to another amazing historian who I've already mentioned. If you're paying attention. That was dead long before any of us today existed. At the time he was writing in the 1890s, Turner also recognized a developing method of history that for us today is old. He wrote, There is another and an increasing class of historians to whom history is the study of the economic growth of the people, who aim to show that property, the distribution of wealth, The social conditions of the people are the underlying and determining factors to be studied. This school, whose advanced guard was led by Rocher, having already transformed orthodox political economy by its historical method, is now going on to rewrite history from the economic point of view. Perhaps the best English expression of the ideas of the school is to be found in Thorold Rogers' Economic Interpretation of History. He asserts truly that very often the cause of great political events and great social movements is economical and has hitherto been undetected. These two uses of history and methods of investigation are now long entrenched in historiography. It was with the shifting of focus to economic factors that you might argue that the new social history and revisionism that gained speed from the 60s, 70s onto the present was born. And Turner, writing back in the 1890s, recognized its importance and almost predicted its outcome, writing, quote, viewed from this position, the past is filled with new meaning. The focal point of modern interest is the fourth estate, the great mass of the people. History has been a romance and a tragedy. In it, we read the brilliant annals of the few, the intrigues of courts, knightly valor, palaces and pyramids, the loves of ladies, the songs of minstrels, and the chants from cathedrals pass like a pageant. 
or linger like a strain of music as we turn the pages. But history has its tragedy as well, which tells of the degraded tillers of the soil, toying that others might dream. The slavery that rendered possible the glory that was Greece, the serfdom into which decayed the grandeur that was Rome, these as well demand their annals. Far oftener than has yet been shown have the underlying economic facts affecting the breadwinners of the nation been the secrets of the nation's rise or fall, by the side of which much that has passed as history is the merest frippery. End quote by a man writing in the 1890s. Now, Turner, being a child of the 19th century, came of age in the time that the modern study of history, as a method and as a profession, was born. The history that we see now as a profession and discipline in colleges and universities really came to shape and started forming then in the 19th century. Not that long ago, really, when you think about it if you have a longer point of view than we often do now. History had long been art and more, but it was in the 19th century that the idea of history as a social science with a strict method like in science was born. And Turner recognized this, and he wrote, to a large class of writers represented by Hume, the field of historical writing is an arena whereon are to be fought out present partisan debates. Whig is to struggle against Tory, and the party of the writer's choice is to be victorious at whatever cost to the truth. We do not lack these partisan historians in America. To Carlyle, the hero worshiper, history is a stage on which a few great men play their parts To Max Mueller, history is the exposition of the growth of religious ideas. To the moralist, history is the text whereby to teach a lesson. To the metaphysician, history is the fulfillment of a few primary laws. End quote. And he was writing this, talking about partisan divide in the 19th century. With the next lines, Turner began to summarize the reason behind the emergence of the discipline of modern history, writing... Quote, plainly, we may make choice from among many ideals. If now we strive to reduce them to some kind of order, we find that in each age a different ideal of history has prevailed. To the savage, history is the painted scalp, with its symbolic representations of the victims of his valor. Or it is the legend of the gods and heroes of his race attempts to explain the origins of things. Hence, the vast body of mythologies, folklore, and legends in which science, history, fiction are all blended together, judgment and imagination inextricably confused. As time passes, the artistic instinct comes in, and historical writing takes the form of the Iliad or the Nibelungen lead. Still, we have in these writings the reflection of the imaginative, credulous age that believed in the divinity of its heroes and wrote down what it believed. Artistic and critical faculty find expression in Herodotus, father of Greek history, and in Thucydides, the ideal Greek historian, both write from the standpoint of an advanced civilization and strive to present a real picture of the events and an explanation of the causes of the events. But... Thucydides is a Greek. Literature is to him an art and history a part of literature. And so it seems to him no violation of historical truth to make his generals pronounce long orations that were composed for them by the historian. Moreover, early men and Greeks alone believed their own tribe or state to be the favorite of the gods. The rest of humanity was for the most part outside the range of history. Now, I will add, as we get a little farther along, we will see that even historians in the 19th century saw the hand of God in the telling of the story. Now, Turner went on to explain that to the medieval historian, history was the annals of the monastery or the chronicle of court and camp. End quote. It was in Turner's own century in a long-term framework, still not that long ago, that our current understanding of history began to develop. He also wrote, In the 19th century, a new ideal and a method of history arose. 
philosophy prepared the way for it. Schelling taught the doctrine that the state is not in reality governed by laws of man's devising, but is part of the moral order of the universe, ruled by cosmic forces from above. Herder proclaimed the doctrine of growth in human institutions. He saw in history the development of given germs. Religions were to be studied by comparison and by tracing their origins from superstitions up toward rational conceptions of God. Language, too, was no sudden creation but a growth and was to be studied as such, and so with political institutions. Thus he paved the way for the study of comparative philology, of mythology, and of political evolution. Wolf, applying Herder's suggestions to the Iliad, found no single Homer as its author but many. This led to the critical study of the texts. And still continuing with what Turner wrote, Niebuhr applied this mode of study to the Roman historians and proved their incorrectness. Livy's history of early Rome became legend. Then Niebuhr tried to find the real facts. He believed that although the Romans had forgotten their own history, still it was possible by starting with institutions of known reality to construct their predecessors, as the botanist may infer bud from flower. He would trace causes from effect. In other words, so strongly did he believe in the growth of an institution according to fixed laws that he believed he could reconstruct the past reaching the real facts even by means of the incorrect Roman writers. Although he carried his method too far, still it was the foundation of the modern historical school. Turner then went on to say Leopold von Ronck applied this critical method to the study of modern history. To him, a document surviving from the past itself was of far greater value than any amount of tradition regarding the past. To him, the contemporary account rightly used was a far higher authority than the second-hand relation. And a little bit later, Turner went on to say that to tell things as they really were was Rank's ideal, but to him also, history was primarily past politics. And then a little bit later, Turner continued and said it was an age of science. The inductive study of phenomena, which has worked a revolution in our knowledge of the external world was applied to history. In a word, the study of history became scientific and political. Turner then correctly identified the upcoming trend in history. He wrote, Today the questions that are uppermost and that will become increasingly important are not so much political as economic questions. The age of machinery of the factory system is also the age of socialistic inquiry. It is not strange that the predominant historical study is coming to the study of past social conditions. Our conclusion, therefore, is that there is much truth in these conceptions of history. History is past literature. History is past politics. It is past religion. It is past economics. Each age tries to form its own conception of the past. Each age aged, writes the history of the past anew with reference to the conditions uppermost in its own time. Then a little later, history, both objective and subjective, is ever becoming never completed. The centuries unfold to us more and more the meaning of past times. Today, we understand Roman history better than did Livy or Tacitus not only because we know how to use the sources better, but also because the significance of events develops with time. Because today is so much a product of yesterday that yesterday can only be understood as it is explained by today. The aim of history, then, is to know the elements of the present by understanding what came into the present from the past. For the present is simply the developing past, the past, the undeveloped present as well try to understand the egg without a knowledge of its developed form, the chick, as to try to understand the past without bringing to it the explanation of the present, and equally well try to understand an animal without study of its embryology as to understand one's time without study of the events that went before. The antiquarian strives to bring back the past 
for the sake of the past. The historian strives to show the present to itself by revealing its origin from the past. The goal of the antiquarian is the dead past. The goal of the historian is the living present. Now, as I said earlier, one of the things I've seen people complain about is how history should not be rewritten. In a couple of episodes, I have looked at revisionism in history. And as I've mentioned before, usually you hear of revisionism as the trend in history to revisit and explore the past with fresh questions and methods. And there have been many that have looked at it as an attack. Even Elmer Kelton, an author I hold in high esteem. I love his writing, and I consider him, even though he was a novelist, I consider him an authority on Texas history. You can learn a lot by digging into his novels. I'm pretty sure he forgot more about Texas history from reading his books. I see that he knew more than I do over the years than I might ever learn. Even he made some critical remarks regarding politically correct revisionists. Now, here's the odd thing that I've noticed. After reading almost every historical fiction he wrote and listening to and reading several speeches he gave, I might have suspected that he had embraced the work of revisionist historians. Kelton's history, as presented in his fiction, is a realistic history in which most of his heroes are five foot seven and nervous and make mistakes. Many of his villains at times make sacrifices and do something heroic. In some of Kelton's books, there are no clear-cut good guys or bad guys, simply at odds with different justifiable goals. Some lawmen, including Texas Rangers, commit murder and atrocities. Some, many do not. Prejudice and abuse against minorities are not forgotten in the works of Kelton, and they're not ignored, but they're presented harsh and ugly on the page. What Kelton and many present-day people object to is not facing the often ugly truth about the people that came before us, but rather they resent the sense of attacking the flawed people that preceded us with an air of superiority, I guess, for lack of a better term. It is through the strength and perseverance of the persecuted and oppressed who fought for equality, along with the spreading understanding of everyone's shared humanity that we today can so easily sit in judgment of them. We will be judged a hundred years from now as well. What some decry as a rewriting of history is, as we have seen in other episodes, it's, it's not new. And in fact, let me introduce you to a brilliant person who was alive and working at the same time as Frederick Jackson Turner, and her name is Lucy Maynard Salmon. Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Big box retailers led by Walmart and Target are pushing for a bill in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. Senate Bill 1838 would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, visit handsoffmyrewards.com and tell them to oppose credit card routing legislation paid for by the Electronic Payments Coalition. You are listening to Texas History Lessons, a slow walk through Texas history made in Texas by a Texan for everyone, everywhere. She was born July 27, 1853 in Fulton, New York, and she was a professor of history at Vassar College from 1889 until her death in 1927. Salmon was appointed by the Executive Committee of the American Historical Association's Committee of Seven in 1897 the same year of the formation of the Texas State Historical Association, that group of historians influenced the way history was taught at the high school level and had a great range of impact beyond that. She became the first woman to serve on the American Historical Association's executive committee in 1915. We'll be continuing on to learn more about Salmon in the next episode and see what she had to think about what was going on with the study of history and the importance of looking back at it and reviewing what's been written before and adding to it. And it's a pretty remarkable essay 
that she wrote in 1912 called Wise History Rewritten. And as I was going through it, I noticed a lot of profound things she was recognizing back then in 1912 that are relevant today and should be shared. Now, I know I started out with a reference to her and a quote from her. That's very important. But for the sake of brevity and to try to keep the episode not too long, we'll be getting into that fairly soon in the next episode. And we'll learn a lot from her. And then we'll move on. The theme music, as always, is by Derek McClendon. Go check out his music. And if you get lucky, if you're down here in this area of Texas and Western Louisiana, go check out his music. And um, yeah, that's going to do it for us today. So take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Be kind. Adios. Adios.